aerodrome in Britain, the Lorraine squadron prepares for a low flying raid over France. The crews manning this squadron are composed of Frenchmen who escaped from their country before and since the occupation. Trained by the RAF, these men, most of whom have already been condemned to death by their quizzling government, were never asked to take part in bombing their country. They volunteered, realizing the magnitude of the task shared by them in releasing the world from certain slavery. It should not be difficult to imagine their feelings as they take off, perhaps to land a bomb on their own homes. But it is the spirit of these men and those of all the United Nations which justifies the hopes of a people destined to remain under Nazi rule for more than four years. And so with the spectre of victory shadowing their machines, they fly to their target, a power station in the suburbs of Paris. Queen paid a visit to Bomber Command headquarters. Air Chief Marshal Harris, the man responsible for the greatest aerial offensive in history, was able to show them some part of his organization. At this moment, when Bomber Command is attaining new heights, their majesties took the opportunity of congratulating the CNC. The visit brought the acknowledgement of the British people for the superb work carried out by this arm of the Royal Air Force. The first up-to-date aircraft designed as such to go into production in Britain since the outbreak of war was the Avro York, and despite our neglect in the development of airliners from 1918 to 1939, it can be favorably compared with the best of American types in the same category. Suitable for either short or long distance work, the York's interior equipment may be either for freight or for a mixed load of freight and passengers. The design of the wings and the four underslung Merlin engine mountings in the wings are the same as those in the highly successful Lancaster bomber, but in order to provide maximum space within the fuselage, a high wing layout has been adopted. Not so long ago, the American aircraft carrier Wasp was sunk by the Japanese after a gallant battle off Guadalcanal. Canal. Now a new Wasp is launched at a ceremony attended by the sons of the naval officers who went down in that action. The seventh warship in the history of the United States to bear this name slides down the slipway to join the fleet perhaps soon to revenge the sinking of her predecessor. Officers and men of the self-termed Independent Air Force mess together. As the first Mosquito intruder outfit, this squadron has a wonderful record of kills from German aircraft to trains. Officers and sergeants help the ground crew to bomb up. Targets are chosen by the CO from various reports received and then the crews are briefed in the usual way. The squadron termed itself the Independent Air Force because when normal intruder targets are not available, command permits them to act on their own. Tremendous strides have been evident in all branches of the fighting services since 1939, and none have been greater than that of the glider troops. Gliders like these have been in service in Africa and Sicily, and are now training at an American Air Force base for the next invasion.
mechanics nowadays call for split-second timing, and no sooner does one craft leave the ground before another is speeding on its way. G-47 transports towing two gliders demonstrate how a single aircraft can hurl three times as many fighting men against the enemy. objective, the tow line is dropped, the transport flies on, the glider circles for a landing. Water is no hazard. Landings like these may sometimes be necessary and the men are ready for any emergency. The American Air Force commander, General Arnold, watches the maneuvers with a practiced eye. The Italian three-motored Savoia Marchetti bomber makes speed for an Allied airbase. Many units of the late Regia Aeronautica have joined the United Nations as co-belligerents against their former allies. As Allied and Italian officers exchange greetings, Italian fighter planes prepare to come in, preceded by another large bomber. Just as the men of the Italian Navy brought their ships to Allied ports, so do their flyers follow the instructions of their government. After which, they sit down to a square meal provided by their former enemies, seemingly completely unperturbed by the strangeness of the whole situation. Of the many jobs that fall to the lot of the men of the RAF, the feeding of Italian children is certainly a new one. It may well be that the experience gained will be put to good advantage later on. It is, however, little wonder that the service has been received everywhere with such enthusiasm. For the care they have shown in the bombing of occupied territory is no greater than that which they have taken with the children of our former enemies. That the small bambina in the foreground seems more interested in the camera than the food suggests that our lads are doing a mighty fine job. Admiral Mountbatten leaves his plane to meet Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Pierce, CNC of the RAF, Southeast Asia, and other military leaders under his supreme command. The result of this conference has been evident in the victories on the Arakan front. One of the best loved men in any service, Scottish Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Teller inspects a guard of honor before leaving North Africa. He now takes up his duties as Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the 2nd Front Forces in the British Isles. In January 1943, Air Marshal Teller was ordered back to London to become Deputy Chief of the Air Staff. At the last moment, his plans were changed to permit him to attend the Casablanca Conference. It was then that General Eisenhower decided that he must have the Air Marshal to complete his team. Of him, the General said, I have no doubt whatsoever that he is one of the few rarely great military leaders of our time. Soon after his arrival, an enormous gathering of cameramen attended the invasion conference in London. And so the brilliant trio, together with Navy, Army and Air Force chiefs representing the two great democracies, quickly get down to business. Business to be completed in Berlin. Casino Monastery, 1,400-year-old home of the Benedictine Order, which was turned into a fortress by the German army. The decision to bomb this gigantic pillbox 
was a difficult one for the Allied commanders. But the fact that the enemy were using a religious building as a fortress changed its status to a military objective, and the decision was taken. On February the 15th, an attack by Allied bombers followed a warning in 11,000 leaflets. The destruction of the stronghold was a military necessity. So ended an extremely unpleasant task, made necessary by the unscrupulous methods of our enemy. You remember what I told you I'd do, if ever I got out here? Well, I did it. I picked myself a nice, quiet spot in the sun and got right down to it. Of course, you know, I wasn't all that keen to leave the old country, but now I wouldn't have missed this little trip for the world. In our off time, there's cricket. Not like a three-day match at the Oval, but still, it's cricket. And other sorts of games, too. We get up to some pretty fine capers, one way and another. And I've met some pretty decent blokes out here. Chaps I don't want to lose sight of. Afterwards, if you know what I mean. Then there's leave. That's all right, too, even if it is only a 48. Of course, you can't go far, but wherever you go, it's pretty safe to say you've never been there before. Travel's cheap enough, but we don't have to do this so much now, because you see, they got these special pickup points, and it's just like waiting for the old 73 back home. On seven days, of course, you've got to take a bit more with you. I thought this might come in handy but I travel like myself. You can go where you like, more or less, and take your time about it. Even if you go to sleep, you've no need to worry. Somebody will stop and pick you up. You can see places you've only read about in books. Strange they seem at first, but it's surprising how soon you feel at home. There's lots of things to buy, things that you lads back home haven't seen for years. As far as the stockings went, I'd add it, you can tell Ida. The brown jobs had been there first and spoiled the market. You can spend your money all right, if you want to. But there's plenty to do for nothing. You never know who you're going to meet out here. Good afternoon, rich people. Good afternoon. <laughs> then there's other things. I shouldn't mention this to Ida. They seem to enjoy themselves too. They're um, WAFs. They're living on a kind of boat. Well, as I told you, I wouldn't have missed this picnic for anything. You seem to get a a broader sort of outlook on life out here. When they have dances, they've got to dance with themselves. Silly, isn't it? Of course, you've got to work fast. But it's the same here as it is back home. It can be done, if you put your mind to it. Well, cheer over now, boy. I'll be seeing you. Pacific Front, the Battle of a Thousand Islands each one a battle of combined operations. These pictures show an action against one of those islands. Sea, air and land forces all playing an equal part. The United Nations have taken the offensive from Burma to the Marshall Islands and onwards to Japan proper.
aircraft carriers are playing a vital part in this type of warfare. And these, perhaps the most remarkable pictures ever seen, show you an attack by Japanese aircraft. An attack that failed. 